Good evening and welcome to right. Sustainability Live. Absolutely. I'm your host, okay. Mark Westwind. Nice. Tonight's topic is urban agriculture and what's happening in Contra Costa County. Let me begin by defining urban agriculture. What is urban agriculture? Well, I'm sure we'll be getting a more detailed definition from our guest tonight, but for now, I'll use the phrase to include local community gardening, urban farming, urban gleaning, farmers markets, and intensive food production in our urban environment. Urban agriculture also includes animal husbandry, beekeeping, and aquaculture. Urban agriculture in Contra Costa has been around for decades. Um, early on, it was more homesteading. Uh, people had big tracts of land uh, in different places before the suburbanization of most of our county and backyard gardens. In 1975, the county's Office of Economic Opportunity provided funds to create community gardens around the county. And from that initial seed funding, 13 community gardens were launched in that, under that program and several more in parallel were started over in the Richmond area. Uh, these were followed in 1980 by the first urban gleaning program and some of the first school gardens. In 1983, the first farmers markets were sprouted up in uh, Pleasant Hill and Walnut Creek followed by markets in Pittsburgh, Antioch and Richmond. One of the most pressing issues over the years has been access to land and the sustainability of that access. Several of those first community gardens were shut down when their land was sold, including the first community garden in Martinez, which was sold by the fire district after being in operation for 35 years. The Antioch Community Garden sold by the Catholic Church after 25 years. Same thing happened to the Brentwood Community Garden, the Tice Valley Community Garden and others. History has shown that the long-term success of a community garden is dependent on two factors. Number one, permanent control over the land, and number two, institutionalization of the garden program. Over the years, urban agriculture has matured. At the same time, the needs of our communities has increased dramatically for food, for garden space, for jobs. Uh, Sustainable Contra Costa's 2014 survey of urban gardening around the county uh, discovered that the waiting list at most of the community gardens in this county ranges from several months to as long as eight years. The average was around two years for community garden space. Despite the, the documented demand, there is still a pressing need for an organized effort to make more permanent space available for community gardening. More recently, several ambitious urban agriculture projects have been launched with broad visions to leverage community gardening and urban agriculture to improve the lives of the people in their communities. Coco Sand Farm in Concord is growing food for the food bank. Family Harvest Farm in Pittsburgh is engaging foster youth in the joy of tending the land. Rogers Ranch in Pleasant Hill is a well-established urban gardening education center. And there's the two organizations that we'll meet tonight. With us tonight are three special guests, each with a a unique perspective on urban food production and urban uh, agriculture in Contra Costa. Let me begin by introducing Doria Robinson. Doria is the executive director of Urban Tilth in Richmond. Founded in 2005, Urban Tilth is a vibrant, successful, and amazing organization in the greater Richmond area. Both Urban Tilth and Doria herself are recipients of leadership in sustainability awards. Welcome, Doria. Uh, our next guest is Ray Hartz, the founder and executive director of Healthy Hearts Institute in Pittsburgh, a new and visionary community gardening project in Pittsburgh. Welcome, Ray. And we'll hear more about those projects later in, this, in the show tonight. Rob Benetton is joining us. Rob is also um, uh, an urban agricultural specialist. He recently moved from his position as the director of the Contra Costa and Alameda County Cooperative Extension offices to a new position where he's serving as the urban agriculture advisor for the Cooperative Extension's urban agriculture program. Welcome, Rob. Thank you for joining us all. Rob, let's begin with you. We'd like to get a sense of what's going on. What's the state of urban agriculture in Contra Costa these days? Certainly. So, uh, first of all, there's there's growth on the whole, um, but in particular, I would say, uh, and I use of course growth as a metaphor throughout uh, the conversation. Uh, 
I would say in particular, there's growth in capacity to get food to those with the greatest needs. So just wanted to bring that up uh, in particular as a starting point. I'm gonna uh, dive in and, and share screen. And um, before doing that, I would say, Think about uh, urban agriculture as a multifaceted effort. It's got a variety of benefits and it's a response. Urban farming, growing food in and around cities is a response in many ways to issues of equity, to disinvestment in low-income communities, and also uh, to a desire for folks all ac across the county to have healthy, local, and affordable food. That's our key goal among the many, right? And the stack benefits are many as well. So we're gonna dive in uh, with a little bit of uh, framing here of the conversation. Uh, just for some context, the site behind me uh, is from uh, my prior work uh, in New York City with the New York City Housing Authority's Garden and Greening Program. And it is an urban farm uh, on a public housing development in Red Hook, Brooklyn at Red Hook Houses as well. So with that, um, I'm going to share the screen here and dive right in. Um, so okay, here we go. So um, I also really need to thank uh, those that are on the call uh, with us today. Um, I need to thank Mark uh, Westwin and Tyler Snorton Phelps uh, for inviting us onto the call. Uh, and Eliana also for managing all of the various parts of the AV as well. And then Doria Robinson and Ray Hart, uh, who have really some, made some amazing uh, impacts in the communities. Um, Ray coming from Pittsburgh, born and raised in Pittsburgh, Ray Hart's, and Doria Robinson born and raised in uh, Richmond as well. So with that, I just wanna frame some things here, right? As we urbanize, as the city globalizes, right? We're now greater than 50% of the world's populations living in cities, right? And as that happens, there is more and more impervious surfaces. There is uh, impacts on air and water quality. So I'm gonna ask everybody as we dive into this dialogue, this conversation, which we will see as an iterative interactive effort um, to ultimately take a deep breath Okay. Does everybody remember when the skies were orange last year, right? Um, think about particulate in the air and think about our environmental quality in terms of our air, our water, and our soil quality. If we don't have clean air, clean water, and clean soils in which to grow food and have fiber, right? Ultimately, we have a lot of challenges on this planet going on. And as we urbanize more and more of our green spaces, whether they're urban farms, park spaces, community gardens, school gardens, et cetera, are often pushed to the fringes. And historically, uh, agriculture as zoning in cities evolved was pushed out to the fringes as well. And as that was happening also at times was also happening disinvestment in low-income communities as well. So as those sets of frames start to, percolate through your mind, think about the stressors of humanity, how we interface with our ecosystems, our health and well-being, and how that touches on ecosystem services, right? Um, without the clean environmental health, the challenges get greater and greater. We have more underlying diseases, more climate change, more challenges socioeconomically, and those will affect those with the least resources the most and the quickest and the earliest, the soonest, right? In California, last time I checked, we had about close to a million people living in food deserts, more than a mile away from the nearest supermarket, grocery store, or healthy food source. 45% of those were living in low-income urban areas. And 371 or so census tracts uh, or 85% of those are urban areas. So think about that in terms of proportionality, in terms of our population spread across the state, right? And then think of the definition. How do we define urban ag? Urban agriculture, urban farming is a complex thing. And it's not just growing produce, by the way. There's 
aquaculture, there's floriculture, there's um, apiculture, uh, managing bees for their various products, right? So think about urban ag as including production distribution and marketing of food and other ag products within cities and around their edges. And it may be for-profit, non-profit, or community-based in a variety of ways, right? Um, urban ag comes in all shapes and sizes, right? We have micro-scale backyard uh, and market gardens, school gardens, community and religious facilities, therapeutic facilities, therapeutic horticulture and horticultural therapy are becoming more and more prevalent and important these days, and then family farms, and then urban farms taken on by groups uh, that are really trying to reinvest into, into their community a sense of added value that they are the ones that are self-determining their own food, food sovereignty, their own desire to have healthy and affordable local food, um, regardless of the long-term uh, disinvestment. And in fact, as a pushback to the long-term disinvestment in many of their communities. So why is urban ag important, right? It brings people together, it creates more eyes on the community. It's a non-confrontational way to reclaim the land, hopefully for all's benefit, but ultimately, hopefully for those with the least resources to benefit and rebalance the, the equilibrium of resource distribution. And it's also about beautifying and cultivating open space and adding community value. Cultural heritage is expressed. As I was phasing out of the New York City Housing Authority, there was a large influx of uh, folks from Bangladesh who were going fully vertical in places like East and West Harlem and folks in the Lower East Side also growing food. And then you have new urban farms sprouting up. This is City Slickers uh, urban farm in West Oakland, the West Oakland Farm Park, and you're going to hear about North Richmond and many other urban farms during the course of this call. Urban farms and gardens can memorialize people. They can promote public health in terms of reducing stress in, in adults and affecting childhood obesity rates, uh, as well as heart disease. And ultimately, urban farms and urban forestry as well improve air, water, and soil quality. And we need to think about these constructs and the, the benefits and burdens of urban development in terms of how we manage both private and public lands and think of systems that can ultimately, again, rebalance the equilibrium in terms of the resource distribution needed the most. So think of these things in that frame, in that construct, in that uh, future, let's say. And with that, I'm going to uh, also um, introduce um, Doria Robinson. Doria is the executive director uh, for Urban Till. She's also a, a longtime Richmond resident uh, since birth. Uh, she's a third generation uh, Richmond, California resident and the executive director of Urban Till, a community-based organization dedicated to cultivating urban ag to help Richmond build a more sustainable, healthy, and just food system. Dory is a certified permaculture designer, bay-friendly gardener, and nutrition educator. She was recognized as Environmental Advocate of the Year for Contra Costa County and as Woman of the Year for Contra Costa County in 2010. In 2011, Bay Localized presented her with a Community Resiliency Leadership Award. Doria currently lives in the neighborhood where she grew up in Richmond and has uh, some young persons in her family life now in college. <laughs> and so congratulations, Doria, I'm gonna stop sharing. You're muted, Doria. Up oh, there you go. Oops. Oh, and uh, I think I, <laughs> I uh, forgot to. Yeah, I forgot to. Um, I'm really excited to to talk um, about our project in Richmond and about urban self. Um, I'm going to bring up my presentation. I I got it. I just put it in the chat. Sorry. Okay, great. And um, just going to share screens really quick. Okay, so I really want to appreciate Rob for his excellent introduction to urban egg, really hit all the points. And I also just want to talk about impact, um, the impact that urban ag makes on people's bodies, people's minds, people's hearts, people's sense of what's possible. Um, I think a lot of the work that we've done with Urban Tilth over the last 16 years, we're actually 16 years old today. Today is our anniversary. <laughs> Great. Congratulations. 
the, the impact we've made over the last 16 years, I don't think we could have really even imagined um, what we could have done when we first started as just a community garden organization in Richmond. Um, and we definitely have, have cultivated a lot of hope um, in this community. So uh, Urban Tilth today um, is an organization of 51 staff members running nine different programs across West Contra Costa County. We serve over 6,000 people every year directly in our programs. Um, we have a number of food production um, projects. We have a number of school and community garden projects. We have um, some employment programs um, and some training programs with watersheds. Um, and we have this vision. <laughs> to develop this urban farm in North Richmond. We're actually on this site today. We, we are on the site today. It does not look like this today. It looks like, you know, um, the way that projects look when you're dreaming into a space and taking whatever you can to build it out, but we're still doing pretty amazing things. So I wanna talk about the journey that we've taken over the last 16 years to get to the point where we're having this vision of a permanent space that we own in North Richmond, where we can cultivate health in our community, where we can grow food, we can train people, we can employ people, give people a start in life and do things like have a commercial kitchen where people who have food related businesses can launch their own micro, micro enterprises um, at, at for an affordable rate. Have a permanent place, the only place that in North Richmond where you can get fruits and vegetables seven days, seven days a week. So the farm would have its own store. Um, a place where there's an outdoor amphitheater um, where people can come and do cultural activities <laughs> and, and just hang out in the middle of the day. There'll be a cafe on site where we actually plan to do a cooperative cafe where people can learn how to run a cooperative business um, together. So how do we get here? How do we get to this expansive vision to all these staff members? Um, we started with people. We started with a lot of young people. Um, our, first, our first projects were along the Richmond Greenway. It was buried land in this vision that you could take an old defunct railway, railway line and transform it into a place that was you know, vibrant with life and that you could actually you know, take it from a dumping zone <laughs> tons of trash is dumped every day, all day, and make it a, a place where it's life-giving, where it's inspiring. Um, all of the work that we do at all of our sites is done with communities. So even this is a picture of the North Richmond farm a few years ago. Um, even as we build the farm, we build it with community members. Um, when we took a tally at our 10th anniversary, we had 19,000 people who had come through our programs to help build some aspect of a garden or a farm. Um, this is one of our volunteer days when we are actually um, planting the orchard that is now at the North Richmond Farm. We have 74 fruit trees that are planted there that are producing apricots, persimmons, um, hood pears, uh, and uh, apples um, for our CSA boxes these days. That's hundreds of pounds of fruit only in its third year of production. Um, we also host a lot of community events. Again, every single thing we do is with community. And it's not just about the growing and distribution of food, but it's about how we grow and distribute food. Um, I think the biggest disconnect that people have that lands people in ill health, that lands people um, just mentally unhappy, um, it's just being disconnected from each other, from the land, from a sense of purpose in life, um, from the land which has so many stories to teach us, just all the lessons that you learn from cultivating on the land. And so every single thing we do is an effort to bring people, bring those urban dwellers, the majority of people who live in cities, back to the land to get reconnected um, just through the process of learning to grow food. Um, this is our farm today. Um, some of the uh, crop rows that we cultivate for our um, CSA. So we went through a really long process 
Um, all of the different growing locations that Urban Tilt has are on public land. Um, they usually start off as vacant lots, <laughs> vacant lots that are dumped on and really not taken care of. The North Richmond farm was vacant for 40 years before we got there. And we spent literally two and a half years just cleaning the site before we could even start growing soil. And it's been another two years just growing soil, not growing any food, <laughs> just growing soil, cover crops and compost and goats and whatnot. We, I think that when we, as urban people, we live in such a way, we're so disconnected to the impact of our actions on natural systems that we, we do things thinking that, you know, we'll just dump the trash there and it'll just go away somehow, some way, <laughs> you know, it'll just disappear into the void. And it doesn't actually. And, and you know when you un, when you don't cover land when you don't you know kind of nurture life in the soil you know it really gets depleted and so a lot of the work that we do at each of these sites is not only kind of kind of import a garden and pop it up and grow food but we actually take a lot of time to start with bringing life back to the soil growing soil and telling people about how important that is cleaning a site Telling, talking about the, the impact of our actions on land, that there is no such thing as a way when it comes to trash. We need to think about the kinds of things that we bring home from all those dollar stores and where they're gonna end up in the next month. <laughs> so we do a lot more than grow food. I think during COVID, we learned some of the, the biggest lessons. Um, we had a very small CSA before COVID in 2019 that we were pretty proud of, about 100 members, you know, it was, you know, for us, that was really big and we were pretty proud of it. During the first uh, month of lockdown and COVID, the subscription to our CSA doubled. Uh, and so we pulled all of our staff in from all of our school sites, from all of our community gardens, um, and really held up at the three acre farm um, building out the farm, we doubled our growing capacity at the farm, and then we started making relationships with regionally local BIPOC, especially farmers, um, through CAF and through um, Kitchen Table Advisors and through Growing the Table, um, to actually make connections with small farmers who were growing sustainably and who really could see the vision of getting healthy whole food into Richmond, which has all of these food deserts. And so we set up um, the farm as a, a food hub where we literally purchased and, and, and transported far, uh, food from seven different small um, sustainable farms, put it together with our farm and got it out to first 250 families in our own CSA. And then with the help of the USDA Farmers Families Program, we added a totally free CSA for another 200 families in need, especially seniors and disabled folks who could not get to grocery stores during this time. Um, we built out a pretty large operation where we can pack, um, store, um, and distribute. Um, all of these food boxes, this 450 food boxes, 440 food boxes to 440 families delivered to their homes every week that's where we're at right now. We employ 13 staff members, um, local people who never went without during the whole of the COVID crisis because they had a, had a job, <laughs> you know, doing really uh, great. Um, and uh, we also employ another nine people just on the farm. Um, this is our staff packing those boxes, <laughs> getting them out in vans uh, that we do. What you'll see is young people, young people who grew up in Richmond, in San Pablo, um, oftentimes have really limited employment opportunities, you know, either, you know, Urban Tilt or Taco Bell. Um, like they don't really have much to look forward to oftentimes in their future. They're not the ones that are on that college track necessarily, um, or maybe they were on a college track and they just couldn't find their way. Um, this gives them an enormous sense of purpose. Um, we also started doing pop-up farm stands, free farm stands in the middle of food desert areas twice a week in North Richmond uh, near the Center of Health and then on the Richmond Greenway. 
where we literally set up what looks like a very beautiful farmer's market stand, but everything is free. Um, and people come and they can choose what they want and the food gets brought home. Um, so again, 250 families in our subsidized, member subsidized CSA. That's a, some member subsidized because some families actually choose to purposely pay more for their box. So that the very same box can be given to a low income family for less than half the rate. Um, and then we have 190 families currently in our Farmers to Families free CSA box and about 120 families each week who go to those pop-up farm stands. Um, and in the works with CHDC, we're working on developing a cooperative grocery store, the first grocery store in over 50 years in North Richmond. Um, so what does this look like in terms of impact? It looks like just of the food that we grew ourselves, we grew 10,000, over 10,000 pounds of food, which is 17% of the food that we distributed was grown in Contra Costa County at one of our farms and gardens by local people. <laughs> we distributed another 62,000 pounds, over 62,000 pounds from all those partner farms and farmers to all those families, um, uh, keeping people really sustained throughout the crisis and continuing now. We're still delivering those amounts of food to people even as we pull out of the crisis. Um, that's 11,429 boxes delivered. Um, to people like Bertha, you see there at the North Richmond Sen Senior Center. Um, I want to emphasize just the creativity of what this type of, how different this is from Safeway or even Whole Foods, you know, <laughs> when we come knocking on the door to bring food to the senior center, we're people, we're whole people, we know the people there. We had a lot of flowers this season because we were growing flowers on all of our edges and we made bouquets and we brought them to the seniors and it was like a little surprise. One time, um, Andreas and Isabella who are up in the right-hand corner there, left-hand corner there, decided that it'd be really great if they got dressed up and delivered the boxes and a suit and a nice dress <laughs> to the seniors because they just wanted to make them feel like they were worth it, you know, that they weren't isolated and alone through the process. Um, and I think that that's another thing that urban ag gives you an opportunity to do is to make our, our systems more humane. It's not transactional, you know, it's not just you paid this, you get this thing in a plastic bag. It's, hi, I'm Isabella, <laughs> you know, who are you? Who is your, you, who are your people? What do you like? We know certain members of our CSA like Ken and, and Brooke, they love cabbage. So if we have extra cabbage, they get extra cabbage, you know? It's a completely different relationship and it, it's a lot of what's missing in an urban context. We get so isolated. Nobody knows our name. Nobody knows what we like, especially people outside of our families or outside of our immediate communities. And this, this kind of work breaks it down. Not only reconnects you to land, but reconnects you to each other. So I don't wanna go on and on. Hopefully there'll be time for questions. We are on this mission over the next five years to build out that expansive vision of the farm. I can talk a little bit more later if there's time about how all the different steps we got to getting to the place where we're um, in the process of purchasing that land right now, but I'll leave it there for now. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Doria. And uh, before we go back to Rob, I just wanna make a pitch that Urban Tilth is obviously doing tremendous work. And so donations, uh, or you know, you can make a donation on their website. Check out their website. Both of our guests tonight, uh, Doria and Ray, have amazingly beautiful websites with pictures and inspiring stories, so forth. Um, and also, you know, if you're able to volunteer, or vol whether it's volunteering directly or volunteering indirectly, I'm sure you could use the help in any way you can. Right? Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Doria. And so, Rob. Up, oh, you're muted, Rob. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me now. All yes, right. we can. I want to introduce uh, Ray Hartz. Uh, Ray grew up in Pittsburgh, California, um, in a low-income part of Pittsburgh, and 
has his own story to tell, and also is a person like so many of the urban farmers that I know that I've just always had so much respect for because he brought the concept of heart into the conversation through the name of his organization, the Healthy Hearts Institute. And he also sees urban farming as one of a number of pathways towards health and well-being in the communities in which he grew up. And so I'm going to pass uh, the uh, proverbial torch over to uh, Ray, and um, I can share slides or either way. So thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mark, uh, for having me on, and Tyler, um, Rob. Uh, thank you for inviting me into this conversation. Man, Doria, uh, it's difficult to follow everything you just said, man. Like, I don't know, maybe I should have went before you. That was amazing. I love the work that you're doing, super inspiring work. Um, and and I strive to have an uh, impact um, in, in the area that I grew up in, that such as the ones you had in your community. Um, love the work that you're doing. Um, so I'll talk about uh, what is Healthy Hearts. Um, you know, we're a 501c3 um, health and wellness organization. We're based in El Pablo in a, a, a historically low-income community um, of color. Um, I grew up in this area, and, you know, our, our mission is really to empower individual and community transformation through health and, and wellness. Um, we focus on four key elements of, of health. Uh, we focus on stress management, um, nutrition, environmental sustainability, and we hope to begin offering classes, uh, fitness classes um, in, in the next few months. And so our approach to health and wellness is more holistic um, and it's more, uh, we're institute, so we're about educating folks and empowering them um, with the information, the tools and the resources that they need to make uh, good decisions and so they can improve their quality of life. Um, in addition to these, this, uh, these classes that we offer, we also have uh, the community garden and urban farm. Um, and so, you know, the whole goal is really to create a space, uh, kind of like what Doria um, uh, alluded to, um, is working on, um, where people can come together, learn, share, um, share in the culture of health and wellness and, and build community. Um, that's really what we're looking at. Um, and so we're on this plot of land uh, that you see in the background. Um, it's directly in uh, the El Pablo housing community. Um, there's 174 units in this uh, housing development, which is owned by the housing. Of, um, like Doria, this land had laid vacant for about 20 years. It used to be a, a exercise track, a baseball diamond out there. We used to, as a kid, we'd go out there and play. And for over 20 years, it just laid um, vacant and it was a dumping ground. And even today, we're still um, throwing out trash and out, out of the, uh, the space. And so we haven't you know, gotten really far into developing the space and keeping folks uh, from, from dumping in there or throwing trash in there, but we're getting close. I think uh, we've developed this farming area where people are starting to see more green um, and people are starting to walk by uh, for the last three years. Uh, people would just walk by and ignore it. Um, they might look back, but now I see people every once in a while stopping and looking and seeing the development um, in their own backyards. Um, and so that's that's uh, kind of what we're looking at with the, the farm. Um, and we combine it. Uh, I'll give you a quick overview of, of what we've done over the last uh, few years. So in, in 2017, we launched, we launched our community garden um, on this nearly two acre lot. Um, you can see like the grass is maybe four feet high when we um, took over this property. Um, and we started with just 10 uh, garden beds, 10 raised garden beds on a big empty lot. Um, had a few folks come out and turn the ground over and, and transform the ground. Um, and then uh, 2018, we started our first uh, mind body skills group class, which focused on meditation, self expression, autogenic training. Um, and what was interesting about that is that 
uh, prior to launching the garden, we did a community um, engagement event um, with, with some Cal Berkeley grad students where they came out um, and presented to the community different ideas of, of, of activities that they would want to see in the community. Um, and so some would pick uh, fitness classes like Zumba classes, some pick uh, cooking classes, some pick um, uh, martial arts classes. It was just a variety of things. And one of the classes that we put up there was stress management. And what we noticed in this community is like very few people were interested in uh, participating in this management class. Uh, no one wanted to talk about meditation and these other mindfulness classes. Um, but for me, um, growing up and having lived in this community, I felt like that was key to changing um, people's habits um, around health and their interaction with food and just uh, they're creating healthy lifestyles. And so um, I felt it was important to have uh, some type of uh, stress management class. And so we, um, we launched this mindfulness class and I actually pay people stipends to come to this class um, to get them involved in this class. And what we found was um, our first uh, class uh, had six cohorts, um, six people in our, in our first cohort. And after the end of the eight weeks, a hundred percent of the people who had participated, who said before that they didn't want to participate in it, but they were enticed by the stipend and came. A hundred percent of those folks at the end of the class uh, all expressed that if you wanted to be a part of the community guard, or if you wanted to be a part of Healthy Hearts Institute, you had to take the mindfulness class. Um, this class has such an impact on their lives to be able to deal with some of the stresses that they're feeling. Um, some of the folks who were in the class started volunteering. So we partnered with the Contra Costa County Food Bank um, and every second and fourth Sunday, um, we pass out uh, produce with the food bank and the produce that we grow um, at the farm and garden. And so we, we feed about, um, at the height of uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, we were getting like 200 uh, families to come to the, the, uh, our distribution site every second and fourth Sunday. Now it's kind of went down to about 125, but the people who graduated this class, we had like for a while, we had four people who volunteered, who began volunteering to pass out this food, um, who otherwise wasn't involved with uh, the community at all they just live there but now they're out and they're passing out food and so there was um it was a a big a big shift um for the community and so you know i i felt like that class and these these empowerment classes um are are really key to getting people to change um some of their habits um, so we had that, we did two of those and, and we graduated 13 folks um, out of the eight week uh, mind body skills group class um, that was taught by a physician. Um, and then we did a two 10 week organic garden, gardening and environmental sustainability class where folks learned about tools, bugs, compost and carbon sequestration, and then reducing um, their exposure to toxic chemicals through food and household products. Um, that was super helpful. Um, we'd have the class, uh, and I want to thank UC Master Gardeners for coming out and teaching that class and 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 supporting uh, this program. But um, so the, the, the folks will go through the class. We take them out to the garden where they'll get hands-on experience, um, learning how to you know grow food, um, uh, you know, adding compost, um, really understanding what is a good bug and what what's a bad bug. Um, so we. Uh, yeah, so we had, we had a lot of education going on around there. Um, and what you're seeing here is the first 10 beds that we had. Um, and in, in that, that picture is my uh, my daughter and my youngest son. Um, and, and on the bottom picture was what we had uh, for, for the first two years. Um, and that was all we had. But this is where, you know, folks would come out um, and, and, and learn. Um, Besides, so we, we, we completed two of those 10 week classes. Um, and then we, we hosted an eight week ecotherapy class, which was focused on our connection to nature and using that um, to help people reduce their stress. Um, 
Last, we had a, a six-week um, nutrition and cooking demonstration class that taught folks how to read nutrition labels and how to create healthy diets and how to cook healthy meals. Um, I think all of it, you know, was super important to, to build a community. It's, it's, I, I just keep thinking about um, how Doria uh, is doing similar work and um, I, I vision, I envision like having this, this robust community um, space where people are just, you know, being together, um, building a health wellness campus uh, so we can create a, uh, what I call healthy artists who are uh, people that live healthy, uh, socially and connected lives. Um, for me, uh, I think of healthy artists are um, people who regularly meditate, they have some type of mindfulness practice or spiritual practice. Um, they make conscious decisions to reduce their environmental footprints, um, meaning they compost, they recycle, they use less household chemicals, you know, they conserve water, they buy locally sourced food, et cetera, right? Um, they live active lifestyles, meaning they exercise, they walk, they hike, they volunteer, and there are peaceful, people who consume a healthy diets. So I really want to create a space where all these folks um, come together when they're around um, Healthy Hearts Institute, and, and they come to the program, they recognize other people as health partners. People are really making conscious decisions to improve the health of their community um, and their environment. Um, and so the goal is like when they're around each other, um, conversation, natural conversations will emerge um, where they can talk about how do we make the world a better place? We are around like-minded people, right? And so that's something that I think uh, creating that space will be super important to making people um, become more civically engaged. Um, so I'll go into why I started Healthy Hearts. Uh, the short answer is I wanted to start a business around my passion for health and wellness, which I developed at an uh, early age. Um, I remember seeing my dad return home. My dad was uh, going in and out of the county jail when I was a kid. And I remember him coming home being built like a real life superhero. He'd uh, make his chest jump up and down and he'd grab onto stop signs and kick his feet out like a, a flag of pride. And I remember him telling me like, if you wanna be able to have strength like this, um, you'd have to do a lot of push-ups. And so at probably age six, seven years old, I, I can remember doing push-ups with my feet on the chair, trying to be uh, like my dad, emulate my dad. And I also remember um, like uh, everybody had gardens um, in their backyard and uh, people mother was sitting on the porch, um, selling peas, cleaning greens, sucking corn. Like there was always this health environment as a kid. It was, El Pueblo was a long, uh, a low income community, but it was also a, a very vibrant community. Um, and so that's what got me started. Um, and then, but, but, you know, that's the short answer, but in the longer answer um, is more multi-layered and complex. Um, that answer is more rooted in the instrument of my ancestors. Um, it's about systemic racism. It's about the lack of access to resources made available to low-income communities like El Pueblo, where I grew up, or other housing projects and ghettos across this country. And I know this conversation is more about food security and urban ag, and not about the social structures of this country, but I feel that it's important to call these things out and to call out white hegemony specifically because they de definitely impacted my decision to build healthy hearts and they helped create communities like El Pueblo that are, that are in need of a healthy hearts, that are in need of an urban tilt, that are in need of so many organizations like ours um, led by people of color who are on the front lines working to improve the health of our disadvantaged communities of color. And uh, it may be a long road to health equity and, and they're improving social, economical and environmental justice in this country or in, in any individual city. Like if we wanna change these counties, um, it's gonna be a long road. And I know that along that road, we're gonna need some healthy food to sustain us, like to keep us strong, uh, to keep us energized. Um, which is a, a good segue for me to talk about urban ag and food security. And I usually would go more in detail about uh, the things that I experienced as a kid um, about the gardens and how the crack academic um, kind of transformed that landscape. But I want to go a little bit uh, more personal 
and talk about like the food that I ate at home and why I believe I ate these foods. Um, my mom um, was a single parent at uh, a five. Her, her and my dad divorced when I was about two years old and she was only like 29 herself. Um, her mother had passed away, her dad lived out of state and she didn't have a lot of support besides her, um, her three siblings uh, close to her age. And my mom had finished high school, but that was the end of her formal education. She didn't come from a family of college graduates um, that had high earning salaries. She came from a family of African-Americans who mi migrated to California from the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration in search of a better life. Uh, my mother came from a family who grew their own food out of necessity, and they moved to Pittsburgh from Arkansas. Um, and they would go, when they moved from Pittsburgh or to Pittsburgh from Arkansas, they would go out to Brentwood to pick fresh produce rather than going to the grocery store. And, um, and that's where she came from, and that's where her heart was. Um, and it was evident in our backyard because uh, she always grew something. She always grew carrots or had a grapevine or a lemon tree or collard greens or watermelon, cherry trees. Um, there was always something growing in, in our yard. And that's who, at her heart, that's who she was. But that didn't reflect our diet as I got older, right? Um, we didn't eat healthy. Uh, I remember um, life, life was happening for her. Like uh, in the third, when I was in the third grade, my mom worked at, uh, a retail store making three twenty-five an hour, trying to raise five kids um, alone. Um, we didn't have a car. Um, we didn't have access to a grocery store, um, and so we um, became a family that ate French fries for dinner, and that was it. Like no sides, no hamburger, and French fries, just French fries uh, or hot dogs, like um, beans. We ate staples that would last and fill us up. We weren't eating. We weren't going to Whole Foods um, in the grocery store. So our access um, was limited for a single mother in these low income communities. And my mother wasn't the only mother that went through these things. The whole community was suffering from that. The whole community got away from our heritage of growing food and providing for ourselves. Um, and so these things really, um, when I think about the work I'm doing, my dad, um, even though he was in and out of jail, my dad was in the streets, did everything, but my dad was a community man. Um, I can remember he took uh, all the kids from the projects to Marine, uh, not Marine World, but Manteca Water Slides. I don't know if you guys remember that, if anyone remember the Manteca Water Slides. He loaded up a, a, a school bus and took all the kids to the water slides and he would show movies in, in El Pavlo and um, in, in these projects, he'd get a wall projector and he would put on movies. And, and so he would try to do what he could in the community um, because it meant something to him. Um, back then, like there was a community. And so, you know, for me to be back in my community where I grew up and doing the work to try to transform it, um, I think is super important. Um, I when, when I hear Doria's story, I think about North Richmond. I think about how they call it Dodge City. Like I, I, I know some guys from that area um, that were in the streets. Um, and I know, you know how the systems has impacted them, criminal justice systems. I, I understand all these things. But I also know that we can, through this food access, through doing these empowerment by organizations, like we can really make effective change. Like Doria, what Doria is doing is evident that these programs work um, and that we need more support um, and people to understand like this is a pathway to get us back on track. Um, and so I think that's pretty much what I had to share with you guys. And I really hope that you, know, um, you guys have questions and and that we can answer and that you guys get involved. Um, don't sit on the sidelines, get in the game, um, make conscious decisions to, to get things back, um, to, to create some health equities in our communities, right? Uh, to improve some of these social injustices and environmental uh, injustices. All right, let's get the work done. So thank you. You know, you. Ray, that that seriously deserves a standing ovation. I am, I am, blown away with your vision and your commitment and your passion. And so Rob, let me, I'm just going to uh, pitch an idea at, at uh, Ray. 
You know, I about several years I was involved with community gardening and and urban gleaning and so forth. And um, several years ago, I uh, and I'm familiar with the Pittsburgh Antioch East County area. I looked at an aerial photograph of the basically the downtown old Pittsburgh uh, area. And it's very clear that the backyards in many of those houses are basically vacant, no landscaping, no trees. And it struck me that we could organize a geek squad type of program that would swoop in, plant a citrus tree, particularly because they're very productive and the, and the fruit is easy to handle. Um, and it's nutritious, obviously. And then periodically come in, tend the crop, tend the trees. And those trees have become an asset for the entire community. They're providing shade. Uh, they're providing food, uh, you know, keeping the young people uh, employed and so forth. So, uh, you know, and, and, and not just, you know, trees, uh, not just citrus trees, but, you know, other trees to not uh, to grow food, but also to just improve the backyards of folks, to give them some greenery and so forth. And um, I know you're probably spread pretty thin with your current vision, but uh, I'd just like to throw that out as I think that's a viable program of uh, reaching out beyond the, using the community garden as a hub, reaching out and basically landscaping everyone's backyards. Because I think, in my opinion, that with someone like you backing the kind of young people that you will attract, creating the trust that's necessary to get permission to go into somebody's backyard to tend the crop on a schedule on a pre-announced basis and so forth. I think that can work. So if you're interested so, in talking so, further about that, let me know. <laughs> so Mark, I, I would say this one key thing related to all of this is affordability of the access to land, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and and that's a key thing. I guess one question I would have for Ray and Doria is if you could go back, you know, two, three, five, seven, ten years plus uh, to the beginning of your process, what would have made it better? Uh, what would make it, what could make it better for the next uh, group of folks that are interested in starting uh, a small urban farming nonprofit or for-profit venture that, um, you know, over the course of time, we would hope, you know, would lead towards success and impact in your local communities. I think we lost the question in that. No, I, I think I get the question. I was just wondering who wanted to go, go first. Okay. I think um, so it's hard because there was a lot of lessons that I think we learned in the first, you know, kind of 10 years um, about how to do this work. Um, I think that we started off in the kind of classic community garden where people would sign up for a bed and, you know, you hope they come and take care of it. And, and then, you know, they'd fall off and, you know, you, how long do you wait before you give it to someone else? And then all this kind of stuff and everything. And we realized that that kind of individual community garden management um, didn't really do all the things that we wanted to do. Like we really wanted to grow as a community. Um, it, not, not just the actual food so, so we could grow a lot of food, but also like not be individual and not fight over, you know, somebody stole your tomatoes or, you know, who pinched your squash flowers or whatever it was. Um, but we wanted to learn and, and, and work with each other. Like the magic is the working with each, with each other. And so it, that all that time of lessons of how to do that was really important. If we had the knowledge that we have it now, it would have been great to have bought land when it was really way cheaper back then. Because um, I think that, you know, when you don't, when you don't own the land that you're on, you're at the mercy of whomever does. And at, at any minute, you could just be moved off. Um, and you can't, it makes it so that you don't do some of the infrastructure investments that make like really impactful growing possible. Like you're not gonna spend two years growing soil if you think me, you might only have three years on a spot. So you're gonna take shortcuts and, you know, do things in a different way. Um, you know, just being able to be on the North Richmond farm with the current 30 year lease 
it made us our vision be like way more expansive we can we, we think in a longer term and now that we're purchasing or trying to purchase the land we even think in a longer term you know and and it really just transforms like the kind of work you can envision you know not just the way you interact with the land but the way you interact with community and the kinds of, of services and institutions you want to you want to make for the long term so I would say that, you know, one, learn, if you're just getting started, like really learn your craft, learn that, that growing process, not just, you know, how to grow some particular fruit or vegetable, but how do you do it in the community that you're in and, and what are the needs of the community of you're in similarly to what are the needs of the plants that you're trying to grow? Because you want to nurture them both and that's how you're going to get a really strong strong system and then figure out how to get landed you know get on land um somebody was talking about land trusts and and things like that and i and i think that yes land trusts convince people convince philanthropy convince people that we need to actually hold these pieces of land collectively in perpetuity so that we can do this kind of healing work for the long term <clears throat> and not have it be a one-off short-term thing because that's not the healing that we need that's not the growing that we need so i'm going to stop there and let someone else speak <laughs> ray thoughts to add yeah yeah i think that uh as, as uh, doria said uh land access um, and ownership like um, for long term uh, she she hit the nail on the head uh, i signed a, a initial three-year land use agreement um that made me make different decisions had i known that i was going to be on a land for a longer period of time yes i can invest in the soil for longer term um, you make different decisions so I think that's uh, number one is long-term land use agreements uh, and ownership, not being able to uh, create uh, the infrastructure that, that you want, like eating restrooms out there, being able to add sewer lines to some permanent buildings is like, if you don't own the land, they don't want any permanent buildings on the property. Um, and that's, if you're going to have a farm, a fully operating farm, you're going to need uh, some permanent infrastructure. Um, the other part uh, I think super is important is, is uh, labor. You have to have people who can actually help build out an organization to make it be what it needs to be, uh, what it needs to be. Like if you have classes, you're going to need a program man. You're going to need someone to set up those classes, find a facilitator. You need to pay someone to be able to do that. So if, if they're not volunteering their time um, and then volunteerism um, isn't necessarily the long term solution. Right. Um, we want to be able to offer jobs to folks in our community um, to take on these roles um, so they can stay within their own community. Um, so just thinking about, you know, ownership of the land, having the funding to hire people from the community to uh, facilitate these classes, programs. Um, there's so many things like, uh, I don't know who's all in the audience, but if you think about a, a business, like we want to run our organizations, we should think about running them as a business, right? In the sense that you need someone in communications, right? You need someone that's doing fundraising. There's like, you need someone, uh, you need an account manager. You need so many things to make this stuff happen so you can have the impact that we are trying to create. And so um, I think just looking at the, um, the capital um, for, for the property and then the labor capital are, are, are key. Um, volunteers are nice, but you got to have a, a solid foundation so you can execute on your vision. Thank you. Thank you both. And I just want to underscore again what Ray, what, uh, Ray just said you cannot build the kind of the kind of organizations that we are running on volunteer labor alone not in the communities that we're trying to serve like the people need to support <laughs> the work in a way where where folks are well they're paid to do the healing work that we need to do like they that that is a job that gets created because the part of a part of the thing that's broken in our communities is that people don't have 
living wage, right. well-paid jobs where they're paying, playing key roles in the community, like providing food or like teaching people how to, you know, handle their stress or, you know, do all the different things, be healthy. Um, if people who were, who were in need actually had, were em employed to do those things, they wouldn't be in need anymore. Like, so it can't just be volunteers. It can't just be outside folks. It's, it's almost like, you know, kind of, you know, uh, uh, inorganic fertilizer, you know, you can't, you can't run, you know, you can't do the kind of healing we're trying to do in our community by, by bringing in, you know, kind of inorganic petroleum based fertilizers that give it a big boom, but in the, in the end strip soil, <laughs> you know, like you could think of the same way in terms of labor, you know, it needs to come from within. It needs to be slow, <laughs> like built slowly. And we need to nurture it. We need to feed it. We need to support it with, with wages. Particularly with the youth. I think, I think Doria, you've been doing excellent work with youth and Ray, I see your vision, vision touches the youth, um, giving them an opportunity to do something productive, be compensated, but also work in a team environment where they're contributing, they're getting support, they're interacting in very positive ways. I think it's very important. It sounds like a really iterative process. I'm gonna ask everybody to take a deep breath again, because um, this is where it's, some of these things can kind of all bridge, hopefully, over time. The themes, you know, I was listening uh, and the words were really clear. Um, words like healing, humane, balance, um, having a name associated with the food, not just the person consuming the food or preparing the food, but also growing the food, being able to name who that person is or was over the course of their life frame, um, vibrancy. Um, I want to highlight that both of our speakers are parents as well, and that we all have a, a multiple layered set of roles in the communities in which we live, work, and serve. Um, I also have to thank uh, Ray for being on this call in particular, because he had an additional commitment that came up and is making an extra effort to be here. Um, so thank you, Ray. This means a lot to us. Um, and then mindfulness and stress management are among the, the key uh, pieces you also brought up um, as well. Um, and so um, I also want to just raise the thought of the disconnection between our food and our farms, um, ourselves as, as people, um, and, and then knowing our farmers, um, and then thinking again about our local environment, right? If we're not able to have each of these three things, everything else doesn't matter, but we need to work together to make these possible. And then the United Nations talks about a definition of sustainable development. What is truly sustainable, right? It's the use of current resources without compromising their future use, right? Without actually detracting their future potential use for growing of food, for growing of good, healthy air, for recreating clean soils. Um, and having clean water to hydrate with, right? And it's really, really important when we think about the concept of sustainable development that we actually think about it, here I have three E's, I got environment and economics, right? But it doesn't balance out without considering equity, without considering the, the distribution of resources over the current time period and the historical time frames. And there's a fourth E that I didn't include here, which is education. Education has not always been uh, as well distributed in many parts of the country and the world as well. Um, and in some cases, there are uh, examples of actual school districts that are known as not being as good comparably to other school districts at times because of this kind of inequitable distribution. And then think about, you know, Ray brought up our ancestral and cultural heritage, right? Um, the knowledge that has been passed down in generations, traditional knowledge. Um, if we don't work together, if we also don't try to create balance again, we can't get to vibrant multicultural livable cities and regions. And family, public, and community health uh, really has to be uplifted um, in the most equitable kind of way possible, as inclusively and as diversely as possible. 
So things to think about. Um, ultimately, I think most, if not all of the urban farming, community garden, school gardening efforts and urban forestry efforts that I see lean towards these. Oops, I forgot an A in Contra Costa, don't kill me. Um, but growing community food, growing community health, local economics, um, having living wages was a key theme that was brought up. Um, the ability to, to pay people so that they can also take some um, proverbial bread to their home, to their families and help pay the bills as well is really, really key. And ultimately growing communities together um, is also uh, important. So I wanna ask, um, Doria and Ray, if you have other thoughts to share uh, as we begin to wrap up. And, um, and also I wanted to put as early as I could the websites of your organizations up uh, also because you're doing amazing work in the communities. And I believe over time, uh, these efforts will have ripple effects. You will literally grow a food web, a local food web. Um, and so, uh, you are both the hub and the spoke. You're both the intersectionality and the strength of that web. So thank you. Great, and thank you, Rob. And so I'd like to open it up to our audience. Uh, we have, we're over eight o'clock, but that's fine. We're not on a fixed schedule. Uh, to invite any members of the audience uh, that would like to ask a question directly, you haven't seen too many in the chat. Uh, for our guests, but if you want to raise your hand or just speak up, I don't think there'll be too much conflict in voice. Um, Ellie, you want to make sure that people are unmuted. I don't know whether we've got them controlled by you or uh, they have control, but uh, anybody have any questions? Uh, I'm seeing everybody muted. Uh, if you want to raise your hand. Unmute. Yeah, so if you there want you go. a virtual hand, um, or just toss out your question, or if it's more comfortable for you all, you can type your questions in the chat as well. Yeah, so wait a second or two more, but if we're not hearing any other questions, did I hear one there? No? Well, all right, well, thank you again, Doria. Appreciate it, you're doing fine work. Ray, I'm inspired. I look forward to seeing your project in several years blossom. And uh, Rob, as always, you're an inspiration for all that you're doing in the greater field of uh, urban agriculture. Uh, so Ellie, what's our sustainability tip of the month? You're muted. <laughs> You're still muted. There I was you go. just too excited to speak. All right, everyone. <laughs> so okay. um, can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Awesome. So this month's uh, sustainability tip of the month is to water plants just enough. So more than 50% of residential water use is spent outdoors. And as many of you know, we are in a drought right now. Um, some things that can help that are California native and drought adapted plants and plants with similar needs together that you can put in microclimates um, to avoid unnecessary irrigation. You could consider installing drip systems or other efficient irrigation methods. Um, or you could also consider drought tolerant perennials instead of a lawn. Um, as part of the summer of wanting to share a lot of uh, information about how to save resources, your local water utility will also have lots of resources as well as information on rebates. Um, two places that you can go to find this information is calscape.org and Sustainable Contra Costa's very own Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge, where you can also learn points and calculate your environmental impact. impact. Um, so that is our sustainability tip of the month. And now I'm going to share with you all a few upcoming events. Um, so our sustainability award nominations close soon on July 2nd, a week, uh, a week from today, I believe. Next Thursday. <laughs> um, I think that's two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, I think that's, no, oh. maybe not. I've lost I track. Go ahead. <laughs> um, where you can honor the great work of your favorite individual, nonprofit, government programs, schools, or businesses. Um, as um, our CEO and president mentioned earlier, 
Uh, Doria is one of our very own sustainability award recipients. And uh, for good reason, thank you for sharing all of the wonderful work that you do. And Ray, thank you for sharing your wonderful work as well. Um, next, we have our Operation Green Mission Possible on July 7th through 23rd. Uh, these will be bi-weekly uh, fun interactive programs for eight through 11 year olds, um, where you can learn about sustainable eating, water and energy conser conservation. Um, and this program is held by our youth-led leadership team, Sustainable Leaders in Action, and they're doing some wonderful work this summer. Um, we also have the Green Sofa Cinema screening of The Last Drop. Uh, there will be a discussion on July 22nd, and you are able to watch this film on your own. Uh, this is about the water crisis, and then join a Zoom discussion uh, to learn more about what all of us can do collectively. Um, you can find all this information at sustainablecoco.org. And for any questions or comments, uh, you can email us at info at sustainablecoco.org. And you can sign up for the challenge at cleaner contra, sorry, cleanercontracosta.org. Um, can I that? interject real quick, Ellie, before you, um, I'll break it up a little bit here. <laughs> I am so motivated and inspired and um, I should say moved by your stories that you shared. Um, Ray, I would never heard your story or known about your project. And I'm, I definitely think it's worthy of being nominated for a sustainability award this year. Um, Doria, it's great to have you and hear how successful the farm is going and the work that you're doing out there. Um, I've been out to your site and it's amazing what you guys are doing in, in the community in Richmond. So. Thank you for your uh, work. And I just wanted to say we, our team recently um, did this sort of, we we're playing a pay it forward game where someone did something for our organization and then we thought, okay, what can we do? So we all showed up and volunteered at the Coco Sand Sustainable Farm. It was so much fun. I was like, we gotta do this every month, you know? And, and so I just encourage other organizations and groups to do it as team building events and get out there and, and get involved and help um, support these local urban farms that need all of our hands to help it going. And many hands make light work and we need lots of hands for these projects. Um, and it's such a great opportunity that it feels good. It feels good to get out and do that work and get your hands in the dirt and see something grow. So thank you for providing those opportunities for everybody. And we wanna help, um, you know, help get people out there. Great. Thanks ever so much, Tina. Thank you, Tina, for that, for that interlude. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to talk to all of you about our Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge. But first, um, I just put the information uh, for you all to take our survey. We would appreciate any feedback you have from us on this uh, regarding this program or future sustainability live topics. Um, and we thank you for joining us tonight. Um, so the Cleaner Contra Costa Challenge um, is a challenge where you are able to um, save money, water, and energy um, by taking sustainable actions in your homes. Um, if you complete one action on the challenge, you get a free yard of mulch from Eco Mulch, or you can enter drawings for a chance to win different gift cards from Rivertown Suites, uh, Bill's Ace Hardware, Moraga, Moraga Hardware and Lumber, Sideboard Neighborhood Kitchen in Lafayette, and um, 511 Contra Costa Clipper Cards. Um, you can visit our website at sustainablecoco.org slash challenge prizes for more details about all of the great things you can win and all of the great um, resources and actions we provide with the challenge. Um, we are also happy to share some energy efficiency resources with you all. Um, we have recently partnered with Energy Upgrade California on a grant to provide you all with information about how to make your homes energy efficient, especially during the summer, um, because small energy efficiencies in our homes and businesses can add up to big losses, both for ourselves and for the state of California. Um, so we would like to provide you with this information so you can find solutions and rebates that help you take meaningful action. And you can visit um, the energy efficiency page I just shared with all of you on our website 
or you can visit Energy Upgrade California at energyupgradeca.org. Um, last but not least, we have uh, the Bay Run program where you can find many options to make your home more comfortable, healthy, safe, durable, and receive rebates up to $5,000. Um, you can find more information about this program at Bay Run Home Plus um, at bayrunresidential.org. And you can find all of this information that I just shared with you at sustainablecoco.org slash energy. Um, Sustainable Contra Costa also um, partners with the county for Bay Run Home Plus um, homeowner workshops as well. So that's another SCOCO event you can stay tuned um, to for the future. Um, we would love it if you would connect with us as we were able to connect with Healthy Hearts today and Urban Tilth and UC Urban Agriculture. So thank you again to Rob, Doria, and Ray for joining us tonight. And finally, you can connect with us um, at our social media channels on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Um, this event tonight has been recorded and will be available on the Skoko YouTube channel by tomorrow night if you are interested in revisiting this uh, program or different portions of it. Um, for any questions or comments, please um, email us at info at sustainablecoco.org or sign up for the challenge at cleanercontracosta.org. Um, and finally, we would love it if you would be able to support our work. Um, while this program is free for everyone to watch, it is not free to produce. So we would thank you in advance for any generous uh, support you would like to um, send our way. And I think I think that has covered most of most of these slides. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, and finally, we would like to thank our sponsors. So this has been Sustainability Live, a production of Sustainable Contra Costa presented as part of our community education and outreach program. Our goals for this show are to provide are to provide you with useful and timely information about all aspects of living sustainably, guided by the 10 One Planet Living Principles, and to provide an online community for sharing information and learning together as we did tonight. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Central San, Mount Diablo Resource Recovery, Contra Costa Green Business Program, MCE, the cities of Antioch, Pittsburgh, Martinez, Pleasant Hill, and Walnut Creek, the town of Moraga, um, Republic Services, Contra Costa Water District, Eco Mulch Recycle Smart, and the Contra Costa Center Transit Village. Um, and tonight's volunteer crew, uh, producer Gotham Seistan, uh, director and host Mark Westwin, and technical director Tyler Snorton Phelps, uh, with assistance from myself, Eliana Vichez. Uh, for more information about One Planet Living and all of sustainable Contra Costa sorry, and all of Sustainable Contra Costa's programs, activities, and special events, please visit our website at sustainablecoco.org. And your support is always welcome. You can also make donations on our website. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Ellie. That was an excellent job. Um, a big shout out to Gotham, who's done an amazing job making all the connections with our speakers. Thank you all for uh, joining us with the show. Thanks again to our speakers. Uh, take care, be safe, enjoy the summer. We'll see you next time. Good night. Good night.